and I'm an application specialist here at Dynamic Biosensors. In this tutorial, I would like to show you how binding kinetics can be measured using our new Helix Biosensor system. We'll be analyzing both association and dissociation kinetic rates, as well as KD values in one hour using only eight picomol of samples and spending less than seven euros in regions. Before we jump right in, let's go over some basic concepts of binding kinetics. Then we can demonstrate how to measure binding kinetics from a practical point of view using the Helix biosensor. And finally, we'll analyze real-time binding data to extract biophysical rate costs. Let's use the example of DNA-DNA interactions because besides being the basis for life as we know it, DNA is also a very nice model system to exemplify how molecular interactions work. On the left, we see the well-known molecular structure of DNA, two strands from a double helix, which is held together by complementary base pairs. The genetic code is defined by the sequence of the bases A, T, C, and G. For our purposes, however, we can think of DNA as a ladder with two elementary types of binding partners, namely G, C, and A, T base pairs. These base pairs hold the two strands together through hydrogen bonds. Because the bonds formed between the strands are non-convalent, the formation of a double-stranded DNA is a reversible process. Two single strands with complementary bases can both associate to form a double strand and also dissociate again. Actually, this is a quite general characteristic of biomolecular recognition. Complexes can form and fall apart again by the virtue of non-covalent interactions. To describe how binding and unbinding proceeds over time, two rate constants are used. The association rate, Ka, and the dissociation rate, Kd. In a way, the process is like a tug of war, dictated by the concentrations of the binding partners. If reacting concentrations are high, the equilibrium shifts to the bound state. If concentrations are low, the equilibrium shifts to the free state. But what are high and low concentrations? In this case, high and low depends on the affinity of the molecular interaction. For every interaction, one can define a characteristic concentration value, the KD value, or dissociation constant. If concentrations are below the KD value, most molecules will be in the free state. If concentrations are above the KD value, most molecules be bound to one another. How can we analyze these biophysical parameters and characterize the molecular interaction? Obviously, we need to bring these binding partners together and allow them to react. In principle, binding experiments can be performed in two ways, with both binding partners in solution or with one binding partner immobilized on the surface and the other in solution. With surface biosensors, Molecules can not only be brought together in a flow channel, but can also be removed from the channel at will. In comparison, this is not possible when measuring in solution, where molecules can be added, but not removed. That's why, with biosensors, we can analyze on and off rates and get the full kinetic information. We'll also see in a minute that the interpretation of experiments with surface to mobilize molecules is more straightforward, because the concentration of only one binding partner needs to be considered. Often, this makes life easier. So, let's get started. Here we have everything we need to carry out our measurements. Firstly, the samples we would like to analyze. Secondly, the Helix biosensor chip. And finally, the Helix instrument itself. So, let's have a closer look on them. We've mentioned earlier that we're going to use DNA as our binding system. So why is that? Well, as you can see from this KD scale, affinities in molecular interactions span many orders of magnitude. On the strong end of the spectrum, you have interactions like avid and biotin, or therapeutic antibodies, which can be engineered to bind their targets at picomolar concentrations. On the other end of the spectrum, there are weak interactions, such as those found as hits in early phases of drug discovery or the interaction of ions with proteins and nucleic acids, which usually occur at micromolar to millimolar concentrations. The amazing thing about nucleic acid interactions is that their affinities can cover the whole range of the spectrum, 
depending on how long the DNA is. While the affinities of individual GC and AT base pairs are extremely weak, the total affinity of a long DNA sequence can become enormously strong, even to the extreme that the stability of the duplex is infinite on practical timescales. We simply have to add more and more base pairs to a sequence to make the duplex strong. For the sake of this tutorial, we're aiming for a KD value somewhere in the middle of this affinity spectrum. A seven base pair deoxyoligonucleotide fits the purpose ideally, as we will confirm later. We'll be using a mixed sequence containing 60% GCs and 40% ATs. To analyze our seven base pair DNA, we'll use a Helix biosensor and a Helix adapter chip. The Helix can be described as a platform technology meaning it can be adapted to measure any molecular interaction of interest. Before we can analyze our seven base bar oligo, we must first functionalize the chip surface with one of our binding partners. This is the chip rack. It holds up to five chips. The Helix is the only biosensor system that can automatically swap chips. But for this simple measurement, we are only going to use one chip. This is the Helix chip. Due to its integrated microfluidics, there is no flow cartridge, or IFC, in the instrument itself, eliminating the need for regular maintenance as in conventional SPR systems. The chip features an RFID tag, which allows the instrument to communicate with the chip to record and display information about the chip type and its usage. You can also read the chip info with our Helix chip app that is available for download now for iOS and Android. This can be especially handy when you are, like me, sometimes working with used chips, and you would like to know how often you or your colleagues have used the chip, at which temperatures it might have been exposed to, which was the last status of the chip, and so on. The actual sensing area is right here, beneath this central opening. Two microelectrodes which are pre-functionalized with DNA anchors. The Helix chip can be modified to measure four interactions simultaneously. Red and green fluorescent signals are detected by single photon counters on two electrodes at the same time. For this tutorial, we won't need the full multiplexing capability of the Helix instrument, so we'll just measure two signals, the sample and a negative control for reference. In the sample spot, we're going to immobilize one of our binding partners, while the reference spot remains unmodified. In our case, the immobilized ligand, as you may remember, is a single-stranded seven-base sequence, and the analyte in solution is its complementary strand. Shown in grey here are linkers, which connect the ligand to the chip surface. Let's have a closer look at how they're set up. The Helix adapter chip features a versatile linker system to immobilize and exchange molecules on the detection spot. It consists of three building blocks, which are all made up of DNA. The anchor is a 48 mer DNA strand that is covalently connected to the gold microelectrodes of the chip via thiol chemistry. The chip already comes pre-modified with anchors, which remain on the surface at all times. The two detection spots are modified with different unique anchor sequences, so they can be individually modified later by a technique called DNA encoded addressing. The second element is the adapter strand, shown in black and pink here. The adapter is a 96 mer DNA strand that hybridizes to the anchor strand with its lower half. The top end of the strand is labeled with a fluorescent dye for detection purposes. The adapter strand is exchangeable and allows our assays to be very flexible. We can choose different fluorescent labels, different lengths of adapter strand, and we can easily regenerate the surface again and again. We can even integrate sophisticated DNA nanostructures such as DNA origamis. The third element is the ligand strand, which is modified with the ligand molecule of interest. The ligand can be anything, a protein, a peptide, a small molecule, or even an RNA or DNA sequence. Because in this tutorial we're using a seven nucleotide DNA sequence as a ligand, we'll simply extend the ligand strand with the sequence of interest. The easiest thing for us to do here was to order the whole sequence from a DNA oligo vendor. Synthesis costs were less than 30 euro, 
And we received enough material for over 300 experiments. Uh, but don't worry, we're not going to perform all of them today. By the way, if we were to run an experiment with the protein ligand, we'd be coupling the protein to the ligand strand using one of Dynamic Biosensor's coupling kits. Uh, for instance, the Amine Reactive Kit. Okay, now let's prepare our samples. Two types of samples have to be prepared. The ligand molecules for immobilization on the chip and a dilution series of our analyte molecules. We can calculate the required volumes and concentrations using the free Dynamic Biosensors Mix and Run app, which guides us through the process step by step and suggests conditions to ensure complete and efficient stabilization. First, we are going to mix the adapter and the ligand strand so they can pre hybridize before the biosensing experiment. After mixing, we are going to incubate the adapter and the ligand strand for a couple of minutes so they have enough time to pre hybridize and form a duplex. Next, we we'll prepare our analyte solutions. We are going to measure five different concentrations of analyte at a dilution factor of two. As we expect the KD value in the nanomolar range, we are going to start at 30 nanomolar and increase the concentration until 500 nanomolar. In principle, kinetic rate constants can be analyzed from a single injection, but it is a good practice to repeat measurements using a couple of different concentrations and then analyze all the data together to improve the accuracy of this. Usually, five concentrations would be Now that our sample preparation is done, we can start our biosensing experiment. By the way, if you are already a Helix user and would like to run this experiment without preparing your own samples, you can try our ready-to-use well plates, which are pre-prepared with all the required solutions. Helix instruments are controlled by the Helio software, which is responsible for planning, performing and analyzing your experiments. Let's first connect our PC to the Helix instrument we're going to use. In the device list, we see all Helix instruments in this network. Because every Helix module has its own embedded PC and dedicated IP address, the instruments form a network of biosensor modules. We can take control of any instrument in the network simply by double-clicking on it. Okay, so now we are going to connect to the Helix name Roxy. Okay, we have connected to Roxy and now we have to open the sample compartment and put in the well plate. The auto sampler is temperature controlled and usually kept below room temperature to have samples fresh and stable. And it is always good to check if there is plenty of running buffer for the dissociation phase. We will be using PBS buffer at physiological salt concentrations. Yup, that will do. The Helios software includes a step-by-step -step guide to plan and set up experimental workflows. Both essays can be also predefined and saved in Helios which allows you to start an experiment with only a few clicks. We are going to take advantage of one of these predefined essays right now, but more details on how to plan experiments with the Helios software are explained in another tutorial, which you can find on the Learning Center at the Dynamic Biosensors homepage. Here's the auto-sampler view, which shows the ligand in blue and the five analyte concentrations in orange. In purple, you can see two other liquids, We'll discuss in a bit what they're used for. But for now, we are all set to measure, so let's press start. While the experiment is running, we can look at what's happening on a molecular level on the chip surface. The kinetics measurement consists of two steps, the association phase and the dissociation phase. During the association phase, analyte is injected into the flow channel and allowed to bind to the immobilized ligand while a constant flow of analyte solution is maintained across the sensor surface. The duration of the association phase is also called contact time, 
because ligand and analyte are allowed to interact. During the dissociation phase, analyte molecules are removed from the channel and pure buffer solution flows across the sensor. Analyte molecules will gradually unbind from the immobilized ligands and wash away. In terms of signal change, this is what we can expect for a one-to-one -one interaction. The number of analyte molecules bound by ligands on the detection spot, the fraction bound, should increase with an exponential time dependence during the association phase and decrease exponentially during the dissociation phase as well. The apparent time constants of the two exponentials reflect the intrinsic rate constants of the interaction, the on and the off rates. Let's look at what we've measured. Here's our real-time data set as displayed in the Helios software, which already contains the most important information about our samples. We can see the five individual runs at different analyte concentrations in the data window, as well as the smooth lines of the fit curves superimposed on top of them that the Helios software has automatically analyzed. The results of this global fit are displayed in the box over here, which lists the association rate constant, the dissociation rate constant, the affinity constant, and the dissociation constant. The mechanism we use to detect binding in real time is fluorescence quenching. Actually, SwitchSen features two measurement modes. The dynamic mode, where the size and conformation of biomolecules are analyzed by measuring their hydrodynamic friction, and the static mode, which is primarily used for real-time binding measurements, and which we've used here. The mechanism involved is quite simple. The fluorescent dye attached to the top of our nanolever is a sensitive reporter of changes in its chemical environment. The dye and the analyte dash ligand complex are both subjected to Brownian motions, causing them to tilt, rotate, and frequently collide with each other. In the presence of analyte molecules, the fluorescence emission intensity of the dye changes by collisional and other quenching processes. The signal decreases when the analyte is bound and increases again when the analyte unbinds from the surface. Whether the signal increases or decreases upon analyte binding is actually not important. What is important is that the signal change scales with the fraction of analyte molecules bound to the sensor surface, which it always does. Because conventionally, Many users preferred the signal to go up during the association phase and go down during the dissociation phase, the y-axis has been inverted here. Before we discuss the fit analysis in more detail, let's briefly compare the raw signals measured from the sample spot and the reference spot. As we can see from the flat lines, no interaction occurred on the unmodified reference spot, so we can conclude that the interaction was a specific binding event between analyte and ligand. Okay. Let's have a closer look at the results of the kinetics analysis and rationalize how the Helios software performed the analysis. The software automatically identifies the association dissociation phases and knowing the concentrations that have been used for the injections, it then performs what we call a global fit. This means it optimizes the two parameters of interest, namely the rate constants Ka and Kd by nonlinear least squares fitting until a best match is reached for all curves at once. This type of global fit procedure is rather strict because the same Ka and Kd values are used for all curves. As I've mentioned before, in principle, it's not necessary to perform multiple injections, but we can see now why doing so improves the accuracy of the analysis. The fit algorithm considers a number of different experimental conditions simultaneously. And when a unique set of Ka and Kd values is found that match all data, we can have high confidence in the quality of the extracted rate constants. Regarding the fitting model that has been used here, it's the most basic and also most stringent model with a minimal set of free parameters that can be employed. When it comes to fitting free parameters to measurement data, without a doubt, less is more. And because our data set beautifully follows the theoretically expected single exponential behavior, we do not have to resort to, for instance, mass transport limited models, which are often used in literature to account for measurement artifacts. Now that we have established a straightforward essay, let's rerun it a couple of times and see how repeatable it is. So far, our measurement series comprised five subsequent runs. Now, we'll repeat this five-run measurement series multiple times. In between experiments, the chip will be regenerated. This involves washing the chip with a high pH solution to denature all DNA strands on the chip surface. The washing step produces a clean chip, where only the covalently attached anchor strands remain. Afterwards, a new ligand can be immobilized, producing a fresh functional chip. 
If you remember the additional solutions in our well plate, this is what they're for. Regeneration and passivation of the chip surface. We don't have to worry about the specifics of this process, however, as it is automatically performed by the Helix instrument. We just need to enter how often we'd like to repeat the experiment and make sure the well plate in the auto sampler contains enough analyte and ligand solutions for all of the runs. I have prepared samples for 14 experiments and already started the repeatability run. All 70 runs were completed successfully and stable signals were observed for all measurements. Let's examine the statistics of the analyzed rate constants. Here's a compilation of all the results we obtained. The seven base pair sequence has a KD value of 37.6 nanomolar, which is a substantial affinity, considering that the oligo we investigated here is rather short. However, the KD value alone doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, the kinetic rate constants Ka and Kd we determined reveal that the formation and denaturation of the DNA duplex is a highly dynamic process. At 3.9 by 10 to the 6 per molar per second, the association rate is high. At the same time, the stability of the complex is rather low, with a dissociation rate of 0.147 per second. That corresponds to a half-life of only 4.7 seconds. Regarding measurement errors, the standard deviation is below 10% for the analyzed rate constants, which is very good. Since we've repeated the experiment multiple times, we can also calculate a standard error, which is only 1-2%. to from this, we can conclude that the repeatability of this assay is excellent. Here we can see a tally of all the reagent costs for the experiment we've just completed. With a total cost of 90 euro for 70 runs, we have a final per run cost of just under 1 euro and 30 cents. So in summary, using the easy to follow Helios software, we've completed 70 runs of our model binding system over 14 separate experiments with a standard error of 3% or less across our three kinetic constants, and at a final cost of only one euro and 30 cents per data point. Hopefully, you now have a better understanding of how the Helix can help you perform your binding kinetics experiments in a user-friendly, cost-effective, and highly reproducible way. That was all for today. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial, and if you have any questions or would like to demo a Helix, don't hesitate to contact us by email. We would be very happy to get in touch with you. Ciao!